This is CVPR 622 Perfusion Techniques 2 and today we're going to be talking about blood gas strategies during hypothermic bypass. Now we've discussed hypothermia as a technique in cardiopulmonary bypass and we talked about its effect on biochemical reactions and metabolism reducing the metabolic rate through lowering the temperature. We've talked about its effect on blood viscosity and how cooling temperatures significantly increases blood viscosity. Uh, but today we're going to really concentrate on the changes in blood gases. Uh, and this is the crux of the issue is that we do something during cardiopulmonary bypass that is not quote normal. We are warm-blooded animals but on bypass we are going to cool patients down at times for certain uh, surgical procedures. So if we look at blood gases, and this is, if you take, if you take a normal blood gas at 37 degrees and 7.4 pH, 40 pCO2, and a 90 for the PO2, and if you put that sample in an airtight container and cool it down, the pH will increase, the CO2 will, pCO2 will decrease, and the partial pressure of oxygen will also have some decrease at well, as well. And so this becomes, uh, the, the, the point is that gases in solution, the solubility changes as temperature changes. It's a very important point to remember to really understand alpha stat and pH stat. Um, so you can see right here, uh, temperature on the x-axis, solubility on the y-axis as temperature goes. And let's let's uh, look at the physiological range that we use during bypass. Uh, we usually are at 30, between 37 and 18 degrees. And you can see in this range that the, the solubility can change significantly across that range. So that the CO2 becomes more soluble. So let's look at this paper. This is an older paper, 1983, but it also looks at that CO2 and it shows that as you cool, as temperature goes down, again, the partial pressure of CO2 goes down. As temperature goes down, solubility goes up and the partial pressure of CO2 goes down. The more soluble it is, the less outward pressure that's being exerted uh, from CO2. So as temperature decreases, solubility increases and the pCO2 decreases. Now what happens? Let's look at our, 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 our friendly equation down here. If, if CO2, if the pCO2 is dropping, it's going to shift this equation to the left which means we're going to have less uh, hydrogen ions in solution. And so what that will do to pH, obviously pH is the negative logarithm of the hydrogen ion concentration. So if you remove hydrogen ions uh, by shifting this equation to the left, by lowering CO2, then your pH will go up. You'll have essentially a respiratory alkalosis being produced just by cooling. And so this raises the question, is that, is that good? Do we, want the, do we want the CO2 to naturally fall with temperature or do we want to maintain a normal, quote, normal CO2 through this range of temperatures? And that's the whole crux of the question that we're going to talk about today. What do you do with temperature and blood gases? Um, and there's two things we can do. We can temperature correct the blood gases. That is, if we cool to 25 degrees, we will measure the actual temperature, the actual pH, pCO2, and PO2 at the actual temperature. We're going to te temperature correct. Remember, blood gas machines are programmed to be normothermia. After all, we're warm-blooded animals. And why would you change the temperature? So blood gas machines will measure blood gases uncorrected or at 37, no matter what the temperature of the blood is. So we can also program these blood gas machines to temperature correct as well. So temperature corrected. Now that's pH stat. That's one way to do it. 
And we can do temperature uncorrected, that's alpha stat. And that is the sample is measured at normal thermia despite the actual blood temperature. We just put it back, we just put it into the blood gas machine and let it do its thing. It's going to give us a blood gas based on a blood temperature of 37. Now it may be 25 degrees, it may be 18 degrees, um, but we maintain normal blood gases in uncorrected form or normal blood gases in corrected form, and that can be very, very different values. So let's look at our, our homeotherm. That's we're warm-blooded animals. If it's, uh, if it's mild outside, 77 degrees, San Diego weather, we're happy as a clam. Uh, we're at 37 degrees. Our blood temperature is normal. Our body temperature is normal. If the temperature goes down to zero degrees, oh, we wrap up in scarves and put earmuffs on and we're shivering, but our temperature is being maintained. That's what warm-blooded animals do. We maintain our normal thermic temperature. And then what about if it's really hot outside? We start sweating, we loosen our ties, we fan ourselves, anything to, uh, to cool off and, and maintain the temperature. But you can see through a wide range of temperatures, we maintain uh, 37 degrees. Now, that, that begs a question. Sometimes during cardiopulmonary bypass, we use neuromuscular blockade to prevent shivering and cool a normally warm-blooded human being down in temperature. So when we do that, again, the question is, should we have normal blood gases at the actual temperature or normal blood gases that are temperature uncorrected? And despite more than 40 years and 50 years now, probably with hypothermic bypass, this still remains a sort of uh, remains a controversial topic, especially in pediatrics, uh, less so in adults. Um, but when we talk about alpha stat and pH stat, it can be very confusing. And there's two ways we can discuss the cop discuss the topic. We can discuss how you technically implement alpha stat and how you technically implement pH stat blood gas strategies and then we can talk about what are the theories behind them what are the biophysical the physiological theories that would advocate for either alpha stat or pH stat strategies so let's go back to our to our human here um, fortunately there's other animal groups that we can uh, we can compare ourselves to. So th this is an alligator. It's a polycheotherm. It's one of the ectotherms, cold-blooded animal. And you can see their blood temperature, their, bo their, their, their body and therefore blood temperature really kind of goes, uh, is, uh, is influenced heavily by the outside. When it's warm, they're warm. Uh, when it's cold, they're much colder. And when it's really hot, they're much warmer too. Uh, they they, uh, they are heavily influenced by the external temperature and they just are cold-blooded animals. They, uh, their blood goes with the environment, whereas we adjust our blood temperature accordingly through the mechanisms that we described earlier. So given this, we see a wide swing in, in temperatures here. What does a polycheotherm do? What is their blood gas strategy? And well, what we have is uh, a concept here. Uh, let's look at water first of all, because what we're dealing with is um, is a, is a electrochemical basis that changes during during cooling. Um, so as you cool, going from 40 to 10 degrees, you can see that the neutrality of water changes, and that subsequently changes the pH. Remember, water is H2O, so it it disassociates into hydrogen ions and hydroxyl anions and that ratio changes with temperature. Hmm. So the neutrality of water is changing along this line where the hydrogen ions and hydroxyl anions uh, equal each other but in different ratios in you know it, in different uh, amounts and so you have a, a swing of uh, in pH. Well if you measure the blood in these animals these polycheotherms cold-blooded animals, their blood does exactly the same thing. It trails, it parallels this natural change. So as this alligator goes from a warm temperature to a cold temperature, his blood becomes more alkaline. Tracks along with the solubility. And so there's things in blood that sort of buffer and re maintain this electrochemical environment um, in, in this animal group. 
And so this has become one of the rationales for alpha-stat is to maintain the electrochemical um, environment. That is an ideal electrochemical uh, environment in, inside the intracellular fluid of, of our cells. And it's keeping this uh, hydroxyl hy and uh, hydrogen ion uh, ratio in, uh, neutral. Now there is a there is a uh, amino acid histidine that's right here that has an imidazole ring, and it has a degree of disassociation. This is referred to as alpha, and this is where we get alpha stat from uh, of 0.55 in the intracellular compartments, and this remains constant despite the changes in temperature. So as the as the pK is changing with temperature, this disassociation uh, is changing with temperature the alpha is remained constant throughout that. So the electrochemical environment remains um, the same. And, and this is important. Remember, um, these histidine amino acids with this imidazole moiety are very, very um, prominent in the active sites of enzymes. And so, you know, again, maintaining this electrochemical environment also influences the structure and the shape and the quaternary structure of this active site, which um, allows these enzymes to maintain their function, uh, you know, despite the changes in temperature. And you can imagine that's good for a cold-blooded animal whose, whose blood temperature is changing. Uh, as they get cold, you know, the enzymes still are, are functioning correctly. And that's what we see. Um, that's one of the theories uh, for using alpha-stat in cardiopulmonary bypass. It's the constant ratio is the important thing to maintain. And with this, you get normal protein structure and function um, you know, throughout the temperature change. And so the theory here is, uh, you know, let's keep the enzymes working the way they're supposed to despite, we're, despite the fact that we're cooling. And this is going to do things like maintain cerebral autoregulation uh, through, throughout the course of cooling longer. So that's an important rationale for alpha-stat, is that proteins and function uh, are preserved. And so what, they, so what advocates of alpha-stat would say is maintain normal blood gases the way you would normally do during bypass. Do not temperature correct them. Maintain a pH of 7.4 and a pCO2 of 40 in an uncorrected way. You just, you just want normal blood gases uncorrected at whatever temperature you're at. But there's another animal group we can look at too um, if you're going to do comparative physiology. And so now there's the hibernators and what they do is their blood temperature changes too throughout the different uh, uh, seasons. Um, their blood temperature can change, not as quite as dramatically as the cold-blooded animals. But what, what we find in the hibernator, you know, as their body cools, their respiration rate cools, they preserve CO2, they allow the CO2 content to build up, and they tend to maintain a normal pH from 37 degrees here to 10 degrees here at a temperature corrected. It's, they they're, they maintain their pH normally. Um, and so they allow the content of CO2. Content of CO2 is different than uh, the partial pressure of CO2. So even though the content went up, if you measured a temperature corrected gas, it would be more along the line of, a, of 40 temperature corrected. Um, so this is pH stat, um, is maintaining normal blood gases at the actual temperature. And so if you're doing deep hypothermic circulatory rest, you may actually have to add CO2 into your gas line that ventilates your oxygenator, oxygenator to increase the CO2 content to maintain 7.40. You know, from a technical standpoint, it's really important to have in, in line arterial blood gas management so you can really control that CO2. If you're titrating CO2 into your gas line, um, that is something that is not without hazards. You need to monitor pCO2 continuously online as you do something like that. 
But the rationale for pH stat is thought that the CO2, first of all, remember as you're cooling, we are shifting the oxygen hemoglobin disassociation curve to the left, making the affinity between hemoglobin and oxygen much stronger. Um, so more CO2 is going to move that oxygen dissociation curve back to the right, allowing oxygen to be released from hemoglobin and made available uh, to the tissue, even at cold temperatures. The other element is that CO2 is a potent cerebral vasodilator. The higher the CO2, the more cerebral vasodilation. And so it promotes a very high cerebral blood flow. Sometimes it's referred to as luxury cerebral perfusion, where the brain is getting more blood than it actually metabolically needs. Um, and the pH stat people would say that's good because you'll have more complete and more homogeneous cooling throughout the brain. Uh, there won't be autoregulation in the brain, and that's good because we don't want little regions of the brain uh, that, that are not homogeneously cooled, little hot spots in the brain. Um, the other element, especially in peds, is it prevents cerebral steel due to the AP collateral, some of those other congenital issues that could actually um, cause cerebral blood flow to be stolen. Uh, so it lowers the resistance uh, to flow in the brain, allowing a higher degree of blood flow. And our goal is to cool that blood, that brain, through and through. So again, let's just rehash this. This is one of those concepts that you think you have it one moment, and then it's like, then it's lost. And so I would go back to some of the resources that are on Blackboard that we have, and, and look at it and keep thinking about this. It can be a challenge, it can be challenging to really get your, get your head around these two, um, these two concepts. But let's rehash it. For pH stat method, the goal is keeping pH 7.4, pCO2 of 40 at any given actual temperature, actual temperature. So it's a corrected sample. And sometimes you have to actually add CO2 in there to, um, to compensate for the increased solubility of CO2. You need to add more CO2 content in to bring the partial pressure up to allow you to do this. On the other, fan, other hand, alpha-stat method is to maintain pH in an uncorrected sample. It's technically easy. Run your normal ABGs based upon the results of the sample. So you, you, know, you are going to respond exactly the same on bypass. You run a blood gas. If the CO2 is high or if the CO2 is low, you're going to adjust your sweeps accordingly. So when talking about alpha stat and pH stat, it's important to understand the, the patient population. Are we talking about adults or neonates? What about the level of hypothermia? You know, certainly mild hypothermia, there's very little difference between alpha stat and pH stat because the temperature is not very different. And remember, alpha stat and pH stat all come together at 37 degrees. They're the same. Um, and then it widens. For deep hypothermia, you will see some really significant differences between a actual temperature and a 37 degree uncorrected temperature. So, um, but that's really important when you're having these discussions. What degree of hypothermia are we talking about? Um, and so in the adult patients, let's talk about them with moderate hypothermia. There is some we do have some recommendations uh, in this, in this uh, paper. It's getting a little dated now. But they say the clinical team should, practice, should manage adult patients undergoing moderate, moderate hypothermia with alpha-stat pH management. And that's a pretty clear, pretty strong level of evidence. Class 1, level A. So, and this is normal. Most every place, at least in the United States, will use alpha-stat management for adults using mild or moderate hypothermia. You know, again, class one, conditions where there's an evidence, general agreement, or both. And level A, data is derived from multiple randomized clinical trials. So very strong, very strong recommendations for alpha stat management in the adult for moderate hypothermia. Now, pediatric patients are, are sort of a different animal, and they, we, uh, you know, there, there is some, there may be some debate with uh, adults with deep hypothermia, but with pediatric patients, 
Um, we've we've looked at some studies um, of alpha stat versus pH stat strategies in, in in the infant population, and this is Richard Jonas. Uh, he's a very very renowned pediatric cardiac surgeon um, who has really advocated the use of of pH stat. And he found this was a single, a randomized single center trial. So randomized is good. Single center, okay. Multi center, even better. And and the results, they looked at uh, psychomotor development index, and they didn't see a big difference between alpha stat and pH stat. Not no significant difference. For mental development index scores, not significantly different there. In fact. The AlphaStat group had significantly higher psychomotor index and mental index scores um, in certain patient groups. So, you know, very, very, uh, there's not an incredible amount of data that says that it's, that it's better, but we can see that it's, um, that AlphaStat or pH is better. But we can see in, in, in the uh, late 80s, almost everybody in pediatrics for deep hypothermic circulatory rest, and this is Bob Groom, um, was using alpha stat. Only about 18% were using pH stat. By 2004, 16% were using alpha stat. 2012, only 15%. Um, and there was a there was a big shift to using pH stat. And we'll talk about this 50% number um, a little later because that's combining both of these, which is an interesting concept. And this is a paper out of Duke um, and looking at the effects of uh, blood gas management and the degree of cooling on cerebral metabolic rate. And so what you want to see is the recovery of metabolic rate. You know, you want to see that, uh, these, you want to see these two bars close together. Uh, this, is, this is the metabolic rate before circa rest and this is after in the lighter gray. So using alpha stat and a pretty cold temperature 14 degrees you can see there's a significant difference between the metabolic rate before the circa rest and after pH stat same but if they actually combined they did a, a pH stat and alpha stat combination that they saw a much closer resumption of uh, cerebral metabolic rate which would suggest a superior technique this was an animal study so we're going to talk about that combination a little bit later, but there's one other thing I, I should mention is what about the PO2 during, during hypothermia? Uh, there is a hyperoxia question out there that must be considered. Now, hyperoxia has been defined a variety of ways, uh, but we're going to define it as a PVO2 of greater than 300 millimeters of mercury. So uh, if you take a venous blood gas and your venous... Um, dissolved oxygen in your venous blood is 300 millimeters of mercury or greater. Um, that has been used as a hyperoxia index in, in deep hypothermic circulatory arrest. And so the idea here is that, you know, we know the dissolved part of oxygen is a small part of the content relative to the bound to hemoglobin part. But there's a thought that during deep hypothermia, that dissolved component becomes more significant because you dissolve as much oxygen into the, into the plasma, that gets translated into the interstitium, and that becomes available to the intracellular fluid as well. Um, plus, at cold temperatures, the oxyhemoglobin curve is, is, is uh, shifted so far to the left that oxygen is really bound tightly to hemoglobin. And we and and that oxygen isn't available as 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 prevalent prevalently. And you can see if you look at um, again the, one of the Bob Groom surveys. I don't have it updated with the 2012 data, but you can see that most people are between 100 and 300 on their PO2s. If you add all of this up, uh, we're looking at you know 80, you know 84 percent or so, something. But there are, it's another group at these really low temperatures that use very high PO2s going in. So these would be part of this hyperoxia group, perhaps, that believe in it. So 
Um, you'll see um, some varieties of techniques out there in the pediatric population with regards to how to manage the PO2 in deep hypothermia. And this is sort of, this is an old paper now, but this is still uh, referred to a lot. Um, and, and this paper was a retrospective paper. They looked at 37 infants that underwent deep hypothermic circulatory arrest. Now group one, they used normoxia, so sort of those normal levels, probably between 150 and 250 of uh, PO2, and the alpha stat method. Group two, they used hyperoxia, and the alpha stat method of blood gas strategies. Group three was normoxia and pH stat, and group four was hyperoxia and pH stat. And what they did is they looked at um, the amount of organic acid that was present upon reinitiation after circulatory arrest. And what they found, here's group one. This is alpha stat and normoxia. Then this is pH stat and normoxia. And you can see that uh, alpha stat and normoxia had the most amount of these organic acids produced. So the lower the bar, the better, um, the better. And you can see these were fairly well matched with the amount of circulatory arrest time. That's an important data point. Um, and so there was a significant difference in the normoxia group if you use pH stat. pH stat was better in terms of the production of organic acid. In the hyperoxia groups, this is hyperoxia with alpha stat and hyperoxia with pH stat. And you can see alpha stat with hyperoxia was as good as normoxia and pH stat. But pH stat in hyperoxia was way better than any of the other three groups. And so this, would, this was suggesting suggest that not only does the blood gas management strategy of alpha stat and pH stat matter, we can see that in the normoxia group, but also the hyperoxia component is also a very important uh, feature. Now this is a very controversial topic in perfusion. This is one of those controversies that we still have today. Is just, you know, just because you see this, is there other untowards events with hyperoxia? Are we forming oxygen-free radicals at a greater rate using hyperoxia? And is that causing other damage that may be even more significant than an organic acid uh, marker? So even though this is a 20-year-old paper, there's still a lot of discussions out there, especially in the pediatric community, about this. And so let's get back to this. Let's talk about this combined. And that's an interesting uh, concept. Uh, how do you combine alpha stat and pH stat together? Well, one of the ways we see is a crossover technique. So the idea that pH stat, you increase the CO2 content as you cool to maintain normal blood gases, and that allows cerebral vasodilation, and that allows very even cooling of the brain uh, in the neonate. And so places will use the pH stat cooling to take advantage of that. Then, right before they circ arrest, they may cross over to alpha stat. Once the brain is cold, then blow off some of that CO2, um, switch to, an, to uh, um, a temperature uncorrected mode, and circ arrest in alpha stat, and then rewarm in alpha stat as well. And that has been a fairly common technique. Um, you know, some places may not cross over. Maybe they'll pH stat all the way into circ arrest and then rewarm using, using alpha stat. Uh, so these crossover techniques, you can see 50%, even, you know, in the course of this uh, eight-year period, is, was held, held constant. So that is a little, that is a popular, uh, that is a popular technique. Now, you know, with the advent of, NEARS monitoring has really penetrated, um, especially being used on a lot of these cases that use deep hypothermic circuitry arrest, either adult or pediatrics, um, has changed the game a lot because I think it sort of blurred the two techniques of alpha stat and pH stat a little bit. Some people will allow their CO2s to rise 
maybe even above a normal uh, normal rate for um, for an alpha stat measurement. But it, they'll they'll monitor the oxygen saturations in the brain using NIRS, and they'll use techniques to optimize that. And so we used to see alpha stat pH debates at every every meeting, every perfusion meeting. We don't really see that anymore. Um, I think we've settled into, hey, let's use alpha stat for the adults. Um, let's use the addition of CO2, allowing the CO2 to go up, um, even in the adults. Um, maybe not a full-fledged pH stat, but sort of a, a hybrid pH stat as you, um, as you cool the brain and as you monitor this parameter that can direct, uh, can direct uh, our interventions. So I en I'm looking forward to discussing this in class, and we'll, we'll see you then. And I hope everyone is staying healthy and safe.